Okay, so today's lecture is a little bit different than what we talked about before. We're not going to talk too much about Fourier transforms and stuff. This lecture is about uh, quantization, okay? So, so far, you know, we've kind of assumed that we have some continuous time signal, x of t, and then what we did for sampling was every capital T units, we would take one reading of that signal, right? Now, in all of our analysis, we kind of implicitly assumed that the reading that we got was exactly the original value of x of t at some point, meaning that we kind of had like infinite precision on that measurement. Whereas in fact, this, we don't actually get these numbers exactly right. Um, you know, in general, what we have instead is a discretized set of levels on the y-axis, and each of these guys that we get gets kind of rounded to the nearest level, right? And so the coarser that these levels are, the worse our representation is going to be for, you know, reconstructing the signal and so on, okay? All right, so um, before I start, so I used to teach a course that we had, I don't think we have it anymore, it was called Introduction to Voice and Image Processing, and so it's about half, you know, speech processing and half image processing, which was kind of interesting, but the problem with that was that you, know, you could really teach a whole course on either of those things, and by doing half speech, half image, you kind of gave the shaft to both of them. So we turned it into a fully image processing course, which I think is good, and hopefully I'll see some of you there next semester. But uh, the speech processing part kind of went by the wayside. So let me say a few words just about speech quickly. So um, what is the Nyquist rate of speech? Well, some of you are doing, um, you know, speech-related projects, and so I think that if you were to record yourself and figure out what the highest frequency was, most of the time you're going to find that for uh, voiced sound. So basically, you know, when I was in college, I I really liked linguistics. So I took a bunch of linguistics courses. So if you make a vowel sound like ah or ooh, where you put your finger on your throat and you can feel your vocal cords vibrating, that's what's called a voiced sound, right? And there are also things like, you know, zzz and zzz, you know, stuff like that. Things where your uh, vocal cords are going, those sounds generally have a, you know, frequency of about not more than 4,000 hertz or so. Okay, so basically voiced sounds, you know, basically are about 4 kilohertz. That means that the Nyquist rate for that would be like 8 kilohertz. And then unvoiced sounds, Unvoiced sounds are the ones where, you know, you don't hear anything coming off of your vocal cords. And so generally, those can be formed by forcing air through your teeth or through your lips, like or stuff like that. And that actually sounds a little bit more like, you know, static, right? And so we know that static and noise in audio signals is high frequency. And so the problem is that this stuff, you know, could be maybe up to 10 kilohertz, which would be that the Nyquist rate would need to be even higher than, than this, okay? Um, but for real life situations, like for example, back when they designed the telephone system, they had to make some decisions about, okay, what is the, you know, what is the frequency response of our channel for the telephone going to be? And so I think that for, you know, uh, POTS, if you guys ever heard this second, plain old telephony system, right? So POTS, I believe, was basically a sampling rate of 8 kilohertz. I wouldn't be surprised if it's similar for today's cell phones and voice over IP and stuff like that, although I don't know for sure. Okay. And that's because, I mean, obviously when you call somebody on the phone, you don't get the fidelity of speech that you would if you were listening to a CD recording of that person talking, right? So a CD is sampled at 44,000 hertz, roughly, right? And that's, you know, basically sampled to be twice the frequency limit of what the human ear could hear, more or less, which is about 20 kilohertz, right? So, you know, the telephone system is much less than that, but certainly it's good enough to get by, right? Um, so just, to, you know, CD quality is basically um, sampling at 44 kilohertz. So about four times faster. And in fact, I believe that the telephone system also has kind of more like a frequency response where it's you know more sensitive in the middle and less sensitive at the ends, right? If you actually look at the frequency response of the telephone channel that's created by the twisted pair copper wire, right? Okay, so 
That was kind of like a digression, okay. So how does this kind of system work in the real world, right? So let's assume that I've already sampled the signal at whatever rate, so eight kilohertz, for example. And so quantization, basically, I take the samples that I get. These are basically infinite resolution. I put them through some sort of a quantizer. And I get some approximate, you know, samples that are not quite where my original samples were. And then I put these through an encoder of some sort. And what comes out is some sort of a code word. And, you know, usually, for example, if I have 256 quantization levels, I might turn that, you know, level into one of the two of the eight binary code words, right? Because then everything becomes a binary signal, and I send that binary signal through my channel. And so I send that signal through my channel, which is my telephone system or my internet voice over IP. What I get out is some new code words. Hopefully those are the same code words that I got originally, but in practice they may be corrupted by noise, for example. And then I take these new guys that I received and I decode them back into kind of approximate levels. And here you kind of have to assume that the quantizer and the encoder and the decoder kind of all agree on a protocol for what the binary code word actually means. And that's kind of the way the system works. And so basically, if I have you know uh, 2 to the 8 equals 256 code words, the idea would be that the bit rate is equal to uh, however many, you know, if I call this B bit binary, right? So basically, if I have B bits and I have a sampling frequency of this, then I get a measurement in bits per second of what my, uh, you know, whole thing is, right? So that kind of takes into account both the sampling on the x-axis and the quantization on the y-axis, right? And so if you look at an audio signal, for example, like if you buy a signal from, or if you buy a, a music uh, track from iTunes, right, it will tell you, you know, this is sampled at 192 kilobits per second, right? Which is basically going to be some trade-off between the sampling rate and the number of quantization levels. And of course, if you want higher fidelity audio, then you pay, I don't know if you pay, you pay, you actually don't pay more for the track anymore if you want really high quality audio, right? Okay. But certainly, if you start to monitor your bitrate for images and audio and video, you can see this is kind of the units of how people judge compression. And so, one thing that we're going to just touch on today, but it's actually a very interesting theory of how do you code and compress data, right? And so, there's whole courses on communication theory, coding theory, information theory. That's where you start to get a lot deeper into some of these issues about how do you actually uh, you know, study the, the coding and the decoding part. So this is just going to touch on that a little bit today. Okay, and so let's talk a little more about this kind of quantization and encoding part. So what this means is that I have a um, the easiest way to think about it is that I have a bunch of positions on the original signal axis. So basically this is the original values. And on this axis I have the quantized values. Values with one L for something. And the idea is that, you know, for example, everything between here zero and here gets quantized to this value x1 hat. Everything between here and here gets quantized to some other value x2 hat, right? And so if I was to draw the relationship between uh, the original signal and the new one, it would kind of look like the stair steppy function, right? Everything between here and goes to here, everything between here and here goes to here, and so on. So this would be like x3 hat, and so on. 
and I guess I would add one more here like this. So what I've drawn here is basically like a three-bit quantizer. There are eight levels. And so what I might do is say, okay, I'm just going to assign binary code words to these levels, and then these are the binary things. What did I miss? Sorry. Right? So the idea would be that in this case, I have this 8-bit quantizer, and anything that's above x4, or I guess anything that's above x3, gets quantized to the maximum code word here. And anything that's you know lower than x minus 3 gets quantized to this code word. Right? So there's kind of like this saturation point where stuff that's beyond the interval gets just flipped to the highest code word. Um, and so basically, these are the code words. These guys we call the transition levels. And these guys we call the reconstruction levels. Okay. And so in this um, lecture, more or less, I'm kind of going to assume that the original values are bounded, right? And that's usually a good assumption for something like speech or images or something like that, right? So we're going to assume that the original guys, xi, are bounded by some maximum value. And so, you know, even if I don't know exactly what that maximum value is, maybe I look at the signal for a while and I compute its variance over the samples that I get, and then I could maybe approximate this as you know four times the standard deviation of x that I observe, right? So even if I know that there may be some values that are wildly outside my limits, then I can kind of capture most of it within the plus or minus four sigma, right? We know from probability that if it's a normal distribution, that captures you know 99 point something percent of the variance, right? Okay, and so what I want to talk about today are just a few options for you know. What should I choose these transition levels to be, and what should I choose those reconstruction levels to be? Okay, there are some there are some simple options, and there are some more complicated options. Okay, so before I go on, any questions about the setup? Okay, so the easiest case is basically kind of as I've drawn it, where the transition levels are spaced apart evenly, and that kind of implies that you know the reconstruction levels are also going to be spaced apart evenly. And that's what's called a uniform quantizer. And that's a very common thing to do, very easy to implement. So easiest case is what's called a uniform quantizer. What that means is that the difference between each of the transition levels is some fixed number delta. And that's also true for each of the reconstruction levels. And so kind of what that means is that if I have uh, this as my step size, if I think about you know, the range of this being from minus x max to plus x max, that means I need to cover the whole range of 2x max by however many levels I have. So that's like saying that we need 2 x max. That means I would have delta would be the width of the interval, and 2 to the b would be how many uh, intervals I would have. And so this basically tells me that I can compute um, my b as being log 2 of 2 x max over delta, right? So if I needed to figure out for a given delta and a given x max, how many levels do I need? This would tell me. Okay. And so this is generally called um, PCM, which stands for pulse code modulation. And the reason for that is that fundamentally, in most real world communication systems, we assume that these code words are binary. Right? So all I'm doing is I'm pulsing the channel at either 1 or 0 to transmit the information. So I get this basically you know, stair-steppy kind of wave. Okay. okay. And so we can kind of analyze how well we expect to do, right? Because certainly the smaller the delta is, the 
better the quantization should be, right? The more faithful the quantized value should be to the original values. And that means that my reconstruction should be better on the other side. And so the idea is, what I say is that my reconstructed value is the same as my original value plus some error, right? And the biggest the error could be is, you know, if I look at this, this is kind of like saying that, okay, so if this thing is a width delta, and I quantize this first guy to like the level delta over two, the worst case scenario is that I'm off by at most delta over two, right? So that's as bad as my error could be. So that's like saying that I have the error ranging in this range. And then to be you know, more mathematical about it, we could put a model on how exactly that error is expected to vary inside that range, okay? And so, um, to go further, we can put a statistical model on the error, right? So for example, we might assume that the expected value of errors at two different times is zero, unless You know, if I'm at the same time, then I get some sort of a noise variance. Otherwise, I get zero. That's like saying that the, you know, each of the noise values is uh, uncorrelated. Also, I usually make the assumption for any m that the error that I get and the original signal value is also uncorrelated. That's like saying that. You know, the errors have nothing to do with the input that's putting in. The errors are just kind of like random, okay? And then probably the simplest assumption is to say the, the PDF of the error is a uniform distribution. That's like saying that the width of this interval is delta, right? So I basically am making myself a little uniform PDF like this, right? And also that kind of makes sense. That's like saying that the error is as likely to be, is equally likely to be distributed anywhere in the interval, right? And so you may remember from probability, that's the first simplest PDF that we talked about, right? And so here we're going to use it right now. Okay. And so clearly this is not like always realistic for any signal, but it gets us pretty close, okay? And actually it's a reasonable approximation for what happens when you do speech signal processing, okay? All right, and so the quality of, of how well we do is often measured by what's called the SNR, the signal to noise ratio, right? So what we want to compute is the, and let me just make a mention here for a second that here I'm kind of assuming that the original signal is zero mean. I mean, I kind of implicitly assume that when I balance the quantizer around zero. So just side note. Okay, and so let's do some analysis. This is like saying the signal to noise ratio is gonna be, a simple version of it is the variance of the input over the variance of the noise, okay? And since everything is zero mean, I can just compute it like this. <coughs> and I can kind of approximate it like this if I'm talking about real data. Okay, and so if we assume that um, you know, if X and E are both assumed to be uniform on you know, these two intervals respectively. Right, we proved back in probability what the variance of a uniform distribution was, right? And that turned out to be basically the width of the distribution squared over 12. And so I can apply that to this to say that um, the variance of this guy is this and uh, now I can kind of plug in what do I know about delta from my previous slide, 
assuming that I constructed delta basically in this way, right, saying that if the delta is related to the number of bits and the maximum size of the channel, I can plug that back in to get this, x max squared over 3 times 2 to the b. And now I can kind of put everything together to say that in dB, so if I take the, you know, if I take uh, 10 log 10 of this thing, if you work it out, what you get is 6B plus some constant minus something that's related to this, okay? And so the key thing that I want you to take home from this is that every bit that I add to the quantizer gives me about 6 dB better SNR, right? So one extra bit leads to 6 dB better SNR. And so an old engineer's rule of thumb is 6 dB per bit, right? And I think I probably said this back in probability maybe or even probability when I taught signals, right? So you may have heard this and seen this before, okay? And so this kind of makes sense, right? This basically says that the more bits I add to the quantizer, the closer together I can push the transition reconstruction levels and the closer my reconstructed x hat will be to my original x's, right? And this gives me a mathematical rule of thumb for how that relationship should work. Okay, so this is only an approximation, um, but it actually does pretty well usually. Okay, um, part of the reason that this may not uh, work very well in practice is that there's this kind of underlying assumption that the original signal is kind of nicely ranging between the maximum and, well, minus x max and plus x max, right? So kind of the assumption here is that you know, my signal looks like something like this. I have, you know, minus x max and plus x max. And if I were to kind of look at my signal, hopefully it would be something where it would range nicely between the positive and negative values. I mean, not periodic like this, but kind of something where, you know, if I were to look at the signal at any point in time, it would be kind of nicely kind of in that range, right? Um, in practice, especially for stuff like speech, that probably isn't true. So, I mean, if you think about the way that you talk on the phone, right, there's long periods of silence and there's places where you may be not talking so loud versus, wow, what would what, you say? You know, like loud parts and small parts. So probably, realistically, speech looks kind of more like, you know, this, where there's not really this kind of sense of uh, looking evenly the same throughout the whole time domain, right? Instead, so there are periods of silence, there are periods of relatively quiet speech, and there are occasional spikes of loud speech, right? And so, in practice, we need a little bit, we need generally more bits than the, unifi the uniform quantizer formula might imply to get us a certain kind of SNR for the kind of signals that we have. So in practice, um, you know, speech coding, with the uniform quantizer uses approximately, let's say, 11 bits. Okay, so one of the problems with this is that, you know, we kind of want the quality of the quantizer not to depend on the range of the input, okay? So um, we kind of want the quantizer to do as well as possible regardless of the signal level. So it would be nice if the quantizer um, had SNR independent of the signal level. 
By which I mean the percentage error would be constant. So kind of the relative error to how high I am right now would be constant. And so we're going to talk about that uh, for the rest of the lecture is that we can do this with non-uniform signal levels, or quantizer levels. Right? So instead of having the reconstruction and transition levels spaced out equally, instead we're going to have them spread out a little bit differently in a way that gives us better performance overall for the quantizer. Okay. And so one example of this is, um, you know, if I want to do this, one example of a non-uniform quantizer is um, we can show this uh, corresponds to a log spacing of quantization levels. So what do I mean by that? Well, the idea is that, you know, one way to think about this is that I can still generate one nice, great uniform quantizer, but instead I process the signal before I put it into the quantizer so that effectively the quantizer levels are different. And so um, here's the idea. So first what I do is I take my original signal values and I take the log of them. Okay. So basically I'm log scaling the input. I guess I should probably put a absolute value there. And then the relationship between x and y is exponential. I had to put the sign bit back on there to make sure I know about positive x's and negative x's. And then what I do is I uniformly quantize this log scaled input. Which I can think of as basically keeping the input and adding to it some error. And then my reconstructed input, once I go back into the non-log world, I take this guy like this. If I plug this in, I get e to the this part is just the same thing I had before. And then e to the that part is e to the error power. And then if I'm assuming the error is small, so if error is small, then I can use the Taylor series approximation to e the x, which is like this. Then there would be x squared, x cubed, and so on. So I can basically say this is like 1 plus this. And that would mean that my error is kind of multiplicative, right? So if I were to look at the um, additive error, this would be like this. This I could turn into some other error that's in the additive back to the original space. And that would mean that my SNR, which would be the variance of x over the variance of f, the additive error here, would just be 1 over the variance of this quantization error here. So the idea here is that I've done things in such a way that regardless of what sigma x is originally, my SNR is only proportional to the variance of the quantization error here. That only depends on the step size of the quantizer. Okay. And so this approach is what's called uh, companding. Or a compander, which is basically a combination of the words compressor, expander. Right, the idea is that I take the original input, I log scale it, that's like compressing it, I uniformly quantize that, and then I expand it back after I've done the you know, transmission and reconstruction of the code words. Okay. 
And so what this means in practice, well, so I can't exactly do this totally in practice because you know if the dynamic range is very large, then um, you know that means that I'm going to have some sort of numerical problems. Um, or actually, maybe the way to think of it is, is, is if this is very small, then the log of this one over something is going to be some really big negative number, and I have to think about how do I handle overflow and stuff like that. In practice, we can kind of approximate this log scaling with what's called a mu law compander, so or a mu law quantizer. So, an approximation to this, an approximation to the ideal log scaling is the mu law quantizer. And that's defined by the following. So there's basically this tunable parameter mu that plays a role in how squished the signal gets. Kind of what this means is that if I make it, it's easier to see it with a plot, right? So if this is my x and this is my y. So let's suppose that x ranges between 0 and x max. If I do this the right way, then y is also going to range between 0 and x max. Now, if mu is equal to 0, that basically means that I'm going to have a straight line here, like this. So basically, mu equals 0 means no distortion of the original signal. But as mu gets bigger, I'm basically going to have more and more sharp changes in how x and y are related. Right? So maybe here, this might be the curve for mu equals, say, 255. Right? As I crank up the mu, my relationship between x and y gets cranked up. And so this means that, for example, uh, if I really care about low va small values of x, this is like saying that all of this small area in x is getting mapped into this big area in y. right? And that means that I'm going to code those small values in x with much better fidelity with my uniform quantizer, whereas all of these regions here, this whole region between this tick mark and x max, gets mapped into a really narrow area of y. And that means that those really large values are not going to get a lot of quantization levels. right? And this is good when we expect the quantization level, or when we expect the original signal to have values that are generally bouncing around you know, quiet values around zero with occasional spikes up to the maximum value. Right? This is saying don't waste a lot of quantization bits on things that don't happen that often. Right? Save your bits for things that are close to zero. Right? And so the idea is that uh, if I were to kind of map out what that means in terms of quantization, so if I was to kind of take this picture and turn it back into a quantization picture, it would be something like this, where I would have um, you know, if I was going to quantize that, maybe what I would do is I would put effective quantization levels at places like this. And each of these guys would get quantized to kind of the corresponding middle value. Right, so here's a case where this is definitely not a uniform quantizer. This is kind of like more like the effective <coughs> mu law quantization. Okay. And so you can show that basically if you do this for real world speech, you can get the same SNR for much fewer bits. Okay? And that's why we want to use it, is that this is maybe a better model for how the original speech x's should behave. And so if I were to kind of carefully put my quantization levels in certain places, I could get away with fewer bits if I have the same quality. Right? So the idea is that um, 
you know, toll quality, which means if you're paying for the phone call, back in the day where you actually had to pay for long distance calls separately from local calls, so toll quality speech used basically 7-bit mu law pulse code modulation. And this basically gave the same kind of quality as measured by SNR as 11-bit uniform quantization. Right? And so that that's a big savings, especially if you're trying to push more phone conversations along the same pipe. You want to use as few bits per conversation as you can get, right? And so, um, you know, this is the way it used to work, at least for telephone signals. And I'm sure that the same kinds of considerations are still in play for things like voice over IP and Skype and so on, right? They're making some choices about how do they code the audio in ways that, is, you know, that are customized to the, the statistical properties of speech, right? So I'm sure, for example, they're not using a uniform quantizer inside Skype. They're using something better than that, right? So even though we don't pay for phone calls over twisted copper wire anymore in the same way, anytime where you've got a, a limited bandwidth channel and you're trying to push lots of conversations through it, this kind of consideration comes into play. Okay, so this is kind of like an approximation to doing better or putting more levels at lower values of x, right? But really what we should do, if you guys remember probability, is we should really customize our quantizer to match exactly the PDF of X, right? If we do the PDF of X, we should be able to make the best possible quantizer for that statistical, you know, input signal, right? And so that would be what I would call quantization for optimal SNR. So quantization for optimal SNR. Right? So we can do better. We should be able to do better than both uniform and mu law if the PDF of X is done. And then we can basically choose the quantization levels to do as best as we can, right? So kind of one way to think about this is the following. So, um, you know, I have the error is the difference between the reconstruction level and the actual value, okay? And so kind of what I want is I want a uh, statistical description of what's going on with that error. So. Really what I want is the statistical variance of this error, which is going to be, since we assume this is zero mean, it's going to be the integral like this, right? This is what we talked about when we talked about the variance, right? This is the definition of the variance, okay? And so now what I want to know is what is the probability of getting a certain error? And what I think about is I break that up into each of these intervals, right? So basically inside each of the um, ranges, what I have is a probability of error. So kind of the, the error plot looks like this, right? So that was a pretty crappy picture, I have to say. Let me try that again. So kind of what I'm trying to say is that, you know, this is the reconstruction level for X1. This is the transition band. So basically here, let's think about just this region, right? So if the actual value of the signal was this, then I would have zero error, right? Because the reconstruction would be exactly what I put in. If the, uh, if the X1 is the furthest away from the transition level that it could be, the maximum error that I can get there is going to be basically like delta over 2, right? So the error is biggest over here, and it's smallest over here, right? And since my 
presumed reconstruction levels are always in the middle of this interval, kind of what I get is this kind of jigsaw, sawtooth pattern of the error that goes across my whole interval like this. And now what I want to know is, what is the kind of expected value of this function, right? Because it could be that these values of x are not all equally likely, right? So kind of this is like saying, what's the expected value of this function? I have to integrate that against the PDF of x, which I'm going to figure out now, right? So kind of a different way of saying this is that the expected value of the error squared is over each of these uh, limits. So for an m-step quantizer, and let's, let's assume, to make things easier, that this is going to have a symmetric distribution. So let's assume that I only have to care about this side of it, and I just double the error on the other side. So that's like saying, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, for each interval, I'm going to integrate between these guys. I guess maybe the way I set this up, I should do it like this. Right? So this is going to be my interval. And I'm going to look at the square of the difference between what I re reconstructed and x. Right? So basically, this by itself is an expression of what is the expected value of this error inside this single interval. And then I add all those intervals up to get the variance across the whole thing. And so kind of, if I'm using my symmetry, that's like saying this. I'm only looking at m over 2 intervals because I don't have to worry about the left-hand side. And so now, what I want to do is, I'm allowed to choose the reconstruction levels and the transition levels. I'm sorry, the transition levels and the reconstruction levels for my quantizer, right? That means I get to choose both these guys and these guys. And so I want to minimize this variance to make the variance as small as possible, right? So how do I minimize something? Well, I take the derivative and I set it equal to zero, right? So. The idea is, you know, to minimize sigma e squared with respect to the transition, or the yeah, the transitions and the reconstructions. I basically going to take derivatives. Okay, so what is the derivative with respect to x hat of i of this thing? Well, the only place where x hat of i appears is inside one of these integrals. And inside that integral, all I have to do is basically, let's ignore the constants. What I have is, I have this integral. I have this thing. Right? So that is what I get if I take the derivative with respect to x hat of i. And what does this say? If I think about this, all this says is that, uh, remember how we defined the mean, right? The mean was if we did this integral, right? So all this is saying is that within each interval, so the reconstruction levels uh, should be at the you know, centroid of the PDF in each interval. Right? All that means is that if I were to write this out, that's like saying that I have um, So that means that I can bring out the xi and say that all I do is take this thing over this thing. 
So that's just like saying, what is the mean of the uh, signal just kind of localized within that little window, right? It's not the overall mean of the signal, it's the mean just inside that region. So it's like if I normalize it to, this is actually like a conditional problem, it's like the conditional mean inside the window, right? So that's really pretty straightforward. And then if I take my error and I minimize the other guy, right? So if I want to figure out where the transition levels are, so let's go back to this. So if I take the uh, derivative of the gradient with respect to sigma xi of this thing, well, that xi appears in two places, right? It appears in the top of one integral and the bottom of another integral, right? And so this is like the fundamental theorem of uh, calculus, right? It says that basically when I take the derivative, I plug in what I get for, you know, I would basically plug in this into this and evaluate it, right? And so what I get there is xi should be halfway between these guys. So the idea is that this tells me that the uh, transition levels should be halfway between the reconstruction levels. And so now what I have basically are two two equations that my quantizer has to satisfy. This tells me how the transition levels are related to the reconstruction levels, ideally. And this tells me how the reconstruction levels are related to the transition levels. And so what I do in practice is maybe I start with a uniform quantizer. That tells me basically you know, one of these things. And then I start to iterate back and forth between these things. And I keep on doing that until my quantizer levels will converge to something. Okay, So the idea is that. Um, the idea is to initialize with a, you know, I, I guess I'm going to say an arbitrary quantizer. For example, a good choice might just be a uniform quantizer. And then, basically, um, uh, iterate. Between, so if I call, yeah, if I call this equation one, and if I call this equation two, then what I would do is I would iterate between equation one and equation two until the x i's and the x hat of i's stop changing significantly. And so this is what I would call the Lloyd Max quantizer. And for this to work, I have to know the PDF of X, right? And so again, in the real world, I could maybe collect the PDF of X by observing five minutes of speech and making myself a PDF, right? Even though that's a, still a pretty crude approximation, because we know that in the real world, you know, the samples of speech are not independent of each other, right? I mean, speech is actually very predictable, which means I can exploit correlations inside the speech signal to predict what the next signal is going to be. And that's actually something that's more related to predictive coding. I'll talk about that in just a second. But assuming that the signal is basically IID signals all drawn from the same original distribution, this would be the right thing to do. Right? And it's not too hard to use MATLAB to kind of generate yourself a optimal quantizer for a given PDF. And you can see that when those levels converge, they're not going to be uniform. They're going to concentrate levels in places where the signal has a lot of variation and then let the levels spread apart, spread apart in places where nothing is likely to happen. And that's exactly what the intuition behind good quantization is. OK, so um, you know, let's just say that um, this is better 
but may not work well for um, kind of highly correlated signals. Right? So, for example, speech is pretty correlated with itself. Okay. And so, the other thing is that one thing that I'm also kind of assuming here is that the PDF of the signal is the same for every signal value, right? But if I go back to my picture of what real signals look like, it may be that the PDF is changing, right? So if I was to look at uh, you know, this kind of sketch, right? Maybe what I would say is, okay, well, maybe I could model this region with the same PDF and this region with the same PDF and this one, but these three, these three PDFs might be different, right? That means that the signal is not stationary. Its statistics are changing over time. And that's, that's really the way real world signals look. And so kind of what I'd like to be able to do is adapt the quantizer to what the signal is doing, right? So if the signal is really quiet, I want to reduce the range of my quantizer and reduce the step size so that I'm quantizing just around zero. And if the signal suddenly gets loud, I want to expand my quantizer to have a much larger range, right? So basically, um, you know, the performance can be improved by adapting the quantizer step size in response to the signal. And sometimes this is called APCM, or adaptive PCM. So one way to think about this is either I can change the levels of the quantizer on the fly, depending on how big the signal is, or I can think about this as kind of pre-scaling the signal according to, uh, kind of in inverse proportion to its magnitude and feeding that into the same quantizer. So either I'm changing the levels or I'm changing the signal before I feed it into the quantizer. And so um, there are kind of two ways to do this. Uh, so we would need to estimate the time varying amplitude of the signal. And there are two ways of doing that. Either I can kind of do a feed forward way or a feedback way. And so let's talk about the feed forward way first. So feed forward adaptation is basically something where the quantizer or the coder has to send some extra information over the channel along with the quantized bits, right? Where it's basically saying, hey, I'm going to tell you the step size that I'm using right now so that you, you know what to do to undo the signal, right? So basically, that's like saying that I take my X of N. First, I pass that through a quantizer to get my X hat of N. And the size of X basically goes through this kind of step size generation process where at every point in time I have a different delta event, which is the step size. That's what the quantizer uses to make this. And then I need to code up this thing and send that over the channel with a code word. And I also have to send over the channel, by the way, this is the step size that I told you to use right now, right? And then on the other end, so basically then we go through the channel Both those things go through the channel. And then what comes back is hopefully I have an approximation of the bit and of the channel. And these both combine to decode my approximate code word, right? And so the flaw with this, obviously, is that I also have to send the step size over the channel. And it's possible that if this gets screwed up, right? Like if somehow the step size gets sent the wrong way, 
then suddenly the code words at the other end are not going to make any sense at all. And the, then the decoding will just be garbage, right? So this is definitely, um, you know, not that great. Let's just talk for a second, though, about what would be a good way to adapt the step size based on the signal values that I'm seeing. Well, the easiest way to do it would be to kind of in short time windows estimate the variance of the signal and use that variance to estimate the kind of maximum x max of the quantizer, right? So here, let's just talk about this process for a second. So we could estimate uh, the variance of x via what I would call the short time energy. So for example, I could make this approximation where I look at my sum of squares of my signal. And, I, and again, kind of like what we talked about last time, maybe I have like a little forgetting factor here that says I'm more concerned with what happened recently than I am with what happened in the distant past. And so basically that's like saying that I have a modification of my previous variance and I add to it this. And then the, the step size I could choose would basically be proportional to the variance. Right? That's like saying that I have maybe some kind of basic step size and I multiply that by my kind of estimated range of the signal. So when I've got a big range, I need to use bigger steps. When I have a smaller range, I can get it with smaller steps, right? And so you and the, well, the coder and the decoder have to agree on this number so that they know, and this protocol, so they know what to do with the step size when it gets to them, right? And so basically the alpha controls kind of the interval um, that contributes to the uh, variance estimate. So this is a definite advantage. You can definitely do a lot better in terms of SNR by adapting the quantizer to what's going on in the signal. Like you can squeeze maybe you know another eight or ten dB out of the SNR by making sure that you're kind of always adapting the quantizer. The disadvantage is that you have to send the step size. And so a way of doing this with feedback instead, so this would be like feedback adaptation, So instead, this would be something like this, where I have x of n goes through a quantizer to produce this, and I get a code word. But the idea is that the code word, the coder that I get, basically The step size that I need is a function of what comes out of the coder. Right? So the idea is that the step size is predicted or is generated from the word that I send across the channel. Right? So the idea is that in this case, the word itself is used as the basis for generating the new step size, and then I only have to send the words. Right? Then I send the words across the channel. You know, I decode to get my x hat of n. And the idea is that this code word that I get also produces this number that I need for the decoder. And so the idea is that you know now the step size is basically a deterministic process of what code words get sent across the channel. And so kind of one way I think about this is that suppose that you were looking at the code words that you got and you realized that you were getting lots of you know, one, one, one. It's like the coder was saturated, right? That would be a clue that, hey, I should crank down the step size on my next iteration because I'm saturating out and maxing out my quantizer, right? And so that, again, is a good thing to do. But now the disadvantage is that if this code were to get screwed up between here and here as it goes through the channel, then I could have some really serious problems, right? Because then I'm, I'm screwing up both the code word and I'm screwing up the step size. And so, um, again, uh, now I have some sort of increased sensitivity to error in the code words, 
So one thing to kind of keep in mind is that um, you know, in a real world channel, it's not like I'm just sending, like if I have to send the code word 010, right? It's not like I just send that 010 across the channel and forget about it, right? There's also like lots of error protection and multiple redundant bits that you use to make sure that your code words don't get screwed up, right? So this is actually a whole course on coding theory, right? Of saying, okay, if I know that the channel has a probability, you know, P of flipping a given bit, then for example, what I could do is I could repeat that, you know, 101 five times to make sure that I'm really telling you that this is 101. If there are occasional bit errors along the way, I kind of take the maximum vote to say, okay, well, you know, maybe some bits got flipped, but majority of the five transmissions, everyone agrees on 101, right? So that's a very crude way of error correction or error protection. There are better ways of doing it, but the point is that you're never sending the code words just like throwing them into the breeze without any sort of protection. I mean, typically you protect them based on your estimated statistics of what's going on in the channel, right? And so this is a whole kind of, I mean, this is actually, if you're gonna take a communication theory course, you'll learn about some of this kind of stuff. It's actually kind of interesting about what's the right way to protect the code words because you don't wanna send any more bits than you have to. You wanna send just enough information to make sure that you're, whatever it is, 99% uh, positive that your code words are getting through the right way. Um, and so again, doing it this way uh, is something where you can really increase your SNR gains. And um, a final way of doing things is that in situations where the signals really correlate with itself, right? So for example, if I were trying to code up a signal that, you know, if I were to blow it up like a speech signal, maybe it looks like this. So instead of sending each of these uh, X values separately, what I could do instead would be to send the differences of adjacent X values, right? Because I assume that what I'm at now is only a little bit different than where I was at before, right? So instead what I could send is, or I could code the differences like this, right? The idea is that these are gonna be much closer to zero and they're gonna vary a lot less, they're gonna have a lot less range, right? And then I can reconstruct them at the end by kind of building up what I got before and adding the difference, right? And so this is sometimes called uh, differential quantization. And you can do even better with that. So it's basically differential pulse code modulation and adaptive differential pulse code modulation and stuff like that, right? So again, if this kind of thing interests you, there are whole courses to take on this kind of topic. Uh, okay, so any questions? This is like the total single introductory lecture to quantization, right? If you were gonna take a course, you would probably devote a lot more in a single lecture to each of these topics. Like you'd probably spend a whole lecture on uniform, whole lecture on mu law, whole lecture on what next. So I really am just kind of giving you the bullet points for the big picture, right? Stuff that you would learn about more if you were taking the real class. Okay, in that case, I will stop this guy.